as soon as you introduce an exogenous for uh, testosterone, that shuts down that system essentially because you're, you're, is it the pituitary gland or the and hypothalamus? The hypothalamus hypothalamus yeah. is saying, hey, there's already enough of this sex hormone around. We don't need to send these signals down. And therefore, you don't get the signal for testosterone production in the testes, but also sperm production. Yes. And so you don't get LH for testosterone, you don't get FSH for sperm, but also testosterone production is vital for sperm production. So even if you had FSH, but you don't have LH to stimulate testosterone production, the testosterone, intratesticular testosterone production is one of the cascades responsible for producing sperm. So when you produce sperm, FSH binds FSH receptor, Sertoli cell starts the sperm and testosterone, intratesticular testosterone also helps with that sperm production. So you need to be producing sperm in order to produce, or testosterone in order to produce sperm. It's interesting. Do you think, I mean, I, I I would presume if you go to a clinic and they give you HRT, they, they talk to you about the effects on fertility. Like, does it completely, does it make you infertile if you're taking a, a HRT dose, getting your testosterone into normal range, you're 30 years old, are you, are you completely infertile? It's a tough one. I've got a friend who uh, says, what do you call a guy on TRT who uses a birth control? A dad, because it's not always 100%. Um, so it's about 60% in the literature is uh, what it says. About 60% of men on TRT will become infertile. Um, that's a big risk for a lot of guys, but like building a family is a really big, important thing. So 60% possibility. Is that reversible though? Sometimes. It's, Sometimes. It's all over the, like, you know, a lot of time, I would say most of the time it probably is, especially given it, I kind of personally hypothesize it has more to do with the time on. So if a guy goes on TRT for let's say six months and decides to come off, that's probably pretty easy to reverse. Conversely, if a guy goes on for six years and their testes haven't been functioning for six years, you know, they've kind of atrophied, they've fibrosed because they're not being used, kind of just a vestige of, of an old organ. So it can be very hard to stimulate those and get those back. Um, so I kind of think that the time on versus time off, and it's usually more the, the testy issue. Luckily, the pituitary is secreting so many other hormones that that's not really atrophying or having an issue. So getting your LH and FSH back is usually not tough, but getting the testes to produce sperm and testosterone is usually harder. Okay. So let's, let's consider an avatar here, a 30 year old male. He is interested in having kids. So he would like to keep his fertility ideally, but he has low testosterone. Let's say it's just a, a little bit low, maybe 280, 260. That was like the bottom end yeah, of that. That's pretty low. Right. It's yeah. pretty low. So it's 260 nanograms per deciliter. Yeah. Wants to stay fertile. What I'm hearing from you is if he was to just go and use an exogenous testosterone, whether that's bought on the streets in the gym or at a HRT clinic, he runs the risk of shutting down his own production of sperm. Correct. And testosterone. Yes. Um, and I think you said that happens to about 60% yeah. of, of people that, that do that, even if he's not using crazy amounts. Right. Okay. So what are his options? Are you know We're going to get to lifestyle, so maybe mm -hmm. there's some lifestyle changes. Absolutely. Um, is HCG an option? Is taking exogenous testosterone, but with something else that keeps mm -hmm. him fertile? Like, what are the things that someone like that should be thinking about? Yeah, first and foremost, I would always say lifestyle. We'll get back to that. We should focus a lot on that because that should always come first. Next, then you can have the discussion of do you want to try you know, HCG monotherapy, so HCG alone to just stimulate the production? Um, do you want to try a SERM, a selective estrogen receptor modulator, and stimulate the pituitary to produce LH and FSH? Do you want to try a combo of those? Some people do that. Um, that's just kind of going overboard, in my opinion. Um, or do you want to go on TRT and add HCG in in hopes that we continue to produce testosterone and sperm while on? There's some data that says being on HCG is like you know, fine, and, and it was like 100% of guys maintain fertility, but we don't always see that in practice when you actually go, when I've seen a lot of guys, close friends of mine, be on TRT with HCG and still have a zero sperm count. So that's a, an issue. But I'll always tell that guy, first and foremost, the most important thing you should probably do before ever going down that road, get your sperm analyzed first. 
because just like testosterone is declining, sperm counts are declining too. And I think a lot of guys have low sperm count beforehand. And if they have low testosterone, they probably have low sperm count because they go hand in hand as we talked about. So they may actually have infertility to begin with. They go on TRT, they try to get off. Now they're blaming the TRT and the doctor for their infertility that they always had, but they never tested. Um, you can also have your sperm frozen, which is a process I understand. It's very difficult on the female to do all of that, but it is something that, you know, if, if a guy's very symptomatic, absolutely needs TRT and he still wants to have a family and he's fertile. You can bank it. Probably a good option to bank it. I think that's important. I, I also, I kind of recommend most guys do it anyways, because I've seen some traumatic injuries on like, you know, pedal bicycles where they fall and hurt their testy and now they're infertile. So probably not a bad idea to do since we have the technology. Um, and if you've done that, if you've frozen, then you always have that in the bank, as you said. So those are kind of your options. You can go HCG alone, uh, a serum alone or TRT with HCG. Now, some clinics will use these newer compounds like gonadarelin. Um, and the idea there is like to stimulate the release of LH and FSH. They don't really work. I'll, I'll say that right now. If your clinic is giving you something like gonadarelin, I would go elsewhere because they're just taking your money. And they should know. If they don't know that it's ineffective, then you get another practitioner. And if they know and they're still giving it to you, then they're, you know, unethical. Um, the gonadarelin is a substance that was used in studies as a pump. So somebody has a pump in their body and it's releasing it all day long. And then the LH and FSH are stimulated. These clinics are selling it for probably like a thousand bucks a pop and they're doing one injection of a week. It's never been shown to work in one injection or two injections or three injections. It's been shown to work as a continuous pump and you don't see LH and FSH increase. And guys are, you know, putting out all this money thinking that they're preserving their fertility and they're not. Um, so if you're going on TRT, the one and only thing that seems to work is HCG. HCG. And I appreciate this. This is probably context dependent, but I think you mentioned before the typical dose of HRT is 100 to 150 milligrams per week. It varies. So I've seen guys on as low as 70 milligrams a week. I've seen guys upwards of 200. Um, I would say 100 is kind of like the endocrinology standards where they start most people. Um, historically... I, I kind of really disagree with the historic endocrinology ways of giving TRT too. They usually give one dose either once a week or sometimes every two weeks. Just mind boggling when you think about the pharmacokinetics of the drug. So it has a half-life around seven days. So at day seven, half of it is gone. Um, and so what they're doing is they're, they're shooting these guys levels up and then they're crashing. You talk to these guys that are on the, the standard treatments and usually, you know, they do their injection Monday by Sunday, they're dragging, they have all their symptoms back. They can't it's wait. It's a till roller Monday. coaster. Yeah. <laughs> so what a lot of newer practitioners have adopted is more frequent micro injections to keep levels a lot more right. stable. The body. What's a, what's a micro? So like if someone was, was on, let's say hundred milligrams a week. You're breaking that down into like, like 20. Three. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. What, like standard, a lot of times people do 120 uh, milligrams a week and they break that up into three forties. Um, so like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, kind of like in every other day, since it's seven days, we don't always get equal, but, uh, yeah, if you can do it more frequently, then the idea there is that the levels stay a lot more stable. What also used to happen a lot with that old way of dosing is we'd start getting all these estrogenic side effects. And that's where we start thinking estrogen is this bad guy. Cause guys can have estrogenic side effects. Like the, the main ones would be around around breast tissue, so gynecomastia, breast growth. So when you're spiking testosterone, you're also spiking estrogen because it's aromatizing. Your estrogen stays high, testosterone drops, and now you have this messed up ratio of very high estrogen to lower testosterone, and guys start having symptomatic you know, estrogen side effects. So a lot of guys can get rid of all of those if they just do more frequent injections, keep their levels a lot more stable as we would naturally, because naturally we would produce a little bit every morning. So our levels just kind of go like this. They're never doing these huge spikes and drops. Mm -hmm.